Welcome back to the Messy Reformation. My name's Jason Rice. I'm the lead pastor at Faith Community CRC in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. My co-host is Willie Cronkey. He's a member at Pease CRC in Pease, Minnesota. We're just a couple of guys who love the Christian Reformed Church and want to see Reformation happen in our denomination. But we realize that whenever Reformation happens in the history of the church, things get messy. And as we prepare for Synod 2024, things continue to get messy. So we're taking the opportunity to have conversations with pastors throughout the Christian Reformed Church to find out what's going on in our denomination, but also to talk about what Reformation might look like. If you haven't already, take a moment, click subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. We're dropping episodes every single Sunday evening. It's also important for you to know that you are our marketing plan. We rely on you to spread the word about what we're doing at the Messy Reformation. We rely on you to share our content. We also rely on you to give us five-star reviews and provide good feedback for this podcast so that the algorithms put out our content further into the world. You are our marketing plan, and we believe we've placed our marketing in good hands. You can also support us financially on Patreon or Substack. All of the money raised is used to further the mission and the platform of the Messy Reformation. With all that said, we're going to get to this week's episode where I share some thoughts on the convening session of Synod 2024. Well, Synod 2024 kicked off this past Wednesday night online, and really not much happened in the meeting. Delegates learned how to use the voting system, and the officers of Synod were elected. You know, they they decided to hold this meeting a few weeks before Synod in order to help things go more smoothly once delegates meet in person. Holding the convening session a few weeks early helps the advisory committees get some of the get-to-know-you things out of the way ahead of time. That way, when they get to Synod, they can just get right to work. It also gives the officers of Synod a couple of weeks to prepare and get ready for the task at hand. And, you know, we did this in 2022, and it seemed to help out quite a bit. And so after the debacle of last year's Synod, where we didn't get all of the work done, I really think it was a good idea to meet online again ahead of time. However, even with such a small agenda, I think this convening session sent a strong message to the denomination. Things are changing. Things are not the way they've been for the past decade or even two decades. Something's happening in the Christian Reformed Church, and that has some people rejoicing, it has other people screaming, and has some people weeping but things are changing nonetheless. And really, it was the election of synod officers that caused all of this. It started with the election for synod president. There was a solid list of names on the ballot. Many of those names were familiar CRC names, people who've been involved in the institution for years. Some of the names just won big awards in the denomination, and they fund large portions of the denomination. And yet, Derek Bukema was elected as president of Synod 2024 on the first round of voting. That means he received over 50% of the vote the first time around. And you know, on the one hand, it, it just shows how competent Derek is at this job. In 2022, he was vice president. He led the entire conversation surrounding the human sexuality report, and he did a phenomenal job. I was just speaking to one of the other delegates from Synod 2022, and they said, I've never seen someone lead a meeting so well in my entire life. He's extremely gifted and competent for the job. And, you know, by the way the initial voting went, it seems like many other people felt the same way as this other delegate. The voting moved on to vice president. This one had to go to a second round of votes, but the role eventually went to Stephen Terpstra. And again, Stephen has been part of Synod a number of times. He's spoken very well and clearly from the floor. And, you know, Stephen's extremely well-versed in Reformed Church polity and our church order. He knows how Synod functions, and he's also just very competent. And so many people are very thankful to see him in this position. When it came to first clerk, the role went to Josh Christoffels after two rounds of voting. 
Uh, the joke we've had with Josh Christoffels has been that he probably sleeps with a copy of the church order on one side and the Acts of Synod on the other side. This guy knows church order forwards and backwards. He knows the history of Synod more than many people that I know. I mean, if you want to know what happened in Synod 1920 or 1902, you can ask Josh and he will most likely be able to tell you. Um, he's the right guy for the job and he has the administrative gifts to do an amazing job as first clerk. I have a personal appreciation for who ended up being voted in for second clerk, who's Dan DeGraff. And anyone who's paid attention to the Messy Reformation should know that Dan DeGraff is on the Messy Reformation team. And so it's exciting to see someone from our team being voted into this type of leadership role at Synod. Dan has attended Synod a number of times. He's also represented himself very well at Synod. Uh, the first time I met Dan was at Synod 2022, and I heard him speak well and effectively and passionately from the floor about our confessions and our doctrinal standards. And so I went and talked to him. We got to meet, and I knew right away that we needed his gifts and talents on our team. And Dan's played a massive role on the Messy Reformation on our team, uh, much more than just writing the podcast summaries. And, and, you know, Dan's a very administrative guy, which makes him a great clerk. And so I'm thankful to see him in this position, and I believe we'll eventually see Dan serving as first clerk sometime in the near future. And so we've got a great slate of officers for Synod 2024, but you know what that means, right? Um, If I'm excited about the officers at Synod, you can be pretty certain there are some people who are very unhappy with this. That's where the screaming and the tears come in. Or maybe I should say the conspiracy theories or maybe both. The more I've thought about conspiracy theories over the years, I've come up with my own way of understanding them. I've come to believe that the vast majority of conspiracy theories are the result of things happening in ways contrary to what was expected, or, uh, to say it another way, things happening contrary to the way in which you see the world. As a result, you can't imagine that things could possibly be this way. Things must have been manipulated. Someone must have put their thumb on the, on the scale. And, and this is what we're seeing coming out of the convening session of Synod. Of course, there's this recurrence of what James Bratt so endearingly called us after Synod 2022. He called us the coup boys. And not that I've seen that explicitly stated, but I've seen a lot of talk about how people assume there's some form of coup happening or the bigger accusation that I've seen thrown out there is that We're the schismatics. And of course, Abide gets all of the love in these sorts of instances. But really, these accusations are being said against anyone who voted for these officers, which is the majority of Synod. Um, They're saying you're being schismatic for voting for these particular people. And, And really what I find absolutely ridiculous is the accusation that Abide is schismatic. I mean, the typical line of reasoning is that since we believe that some people should be allowed to be part of the CRCNA and others should not be part of the CRCNA, we're the schismatic ones. But here's what's really crazy about that line of reasoning. Uh, First, everyone draws lines somewhere. Everyone does. Everyone believes that some people should be allowed to be part of a denomination and that other people should not be allowed to be part of a denomination. Or that even some people may possibly need to be removed from the denomination. Everyone believes this. I guarantee you that if someone in the CRCNA created a group called Kinists United, there would be strong overtures being written to Synod to call these people to repentance or to remove them from the denomination because everyone draws lines. The question is where we draw the lines and who determines where those lines are drawn. Let's make sure we're very clear on this, that all one body and has said and better together have their own lines. They're just not being open and clear about the lines that they're going to draw. Thankfully, abide is very clear. Our lines are the confessions of the church, the declarations made by synod about those confessions and the vows we make in the covenant for office bearers regarding those confessions. 
to make my second point on this, I, I want to continue building on the previous analogy. Just imagine a world in which a group formed in the CRCNA called Kinist United and people were calling for them to repent or be removed from office. Which group would be considered schismatic? Would it be the people who've deviated from the doctrines of our denomination? Or would it be the people calling them to believe in the doctrines of our denomination? I mean, the answer's clear, isn't it? The, the schismatics are the ones who are deviating from our doctrinal teachings. The divisive people are the ones who've wandered away. It's clear as day. And to be honest, this is such an egregious, false accusation that I'm tired of hearing it because it's completely dishonest and this accusation needs to end. And to be completely honest, I want to take a moment just to defend Abide a little bit. Not that they need it, but I want someone to give me clear evidence where Abide is holding to teachings that are contrary to anything our denomination believes. I just want to see it. And the reality is, I don't think you'll find anything anywhere where Abide is promoting something contrary to what the denomination believes. And to be honest, if you did find something, I'm almost certain that Abide would retract it and repent of promoting a teaching that's contrary to the doctrines and the confessions of the Christian Reformed Church. That's just who Abide is. And there's actually nothing schismatic about what they're doing. What they're doing is literally calling the denomination to act in accordance with our official teachings and our official church order. That's it. It's only because we haven't been doing this for decades that anyone sees a problem with it. There's also been a lot of screaming and weeping over the lack of diversity amongst the officers. Of course, the banner had to tip its hat in this direction as well with the headline, Four Midwestern pastors elected as officers of synod. I've heard people frustrated that there are not women amongst the officers, just like last year. I've heard people frustrated that there were no people of color amongst the officers, just like last year. I've heard people frustrated that there's no Canadians amongst the officers, which isn't actually true. But it's still just like two years ago. Stephen Terpstra is a Canadian, and he's pastored churches in Canada. He just happens to be serving a church in the U.S. right now, but we're told he doesn't count as a Canadian. He's not a real Canadian. Eh, whatever. But as you can tell, like this isn't anything new. This is pretty usual to what how things go. We don't have perfect representation on of of the denomination from the officers of synod. And besides all of that, like what does actual diversity look like? I mean, I was talking to someone recently from Iowa and they said and I haven't confirmed this yet, but they said that nobody from Iowa has led Synod for decades. I mean, if that's true, that's nuts because, I mean, Iowa's like secondary mecca of the CRC apart from Grand Rapids. And so, like, where's the outcry about the lack of representation from Iowa? And, you know, I spent some time this week looking at a list of every officer of Synod for the past 40 years and the only name from Wisconsin that I recognized was Les Kuyper, and he served twice. Two times in 40 years. Someone from Wisconsin leading Synod. Where's the outcry about the lack of representation from Wisconsin? I mean, if we want to go down this rabbit hole, I'm sure we can find, and we probably would find, certain classes that have never been represented amongst the officers of Synod. And I want to know, where's the outcry for this lack of representation? And, and to be completely honest, I think people are just tired of the whole DEI diversity thing. I think people are tired of trying to keep up with ticking all the right boxes and manipulating the system in order to tick the right boxes. Instead, they just want to focus on getting the right people into the right positions. They want people who are going to do their job well and lead well. And it doesn't matter if they're from Canada, the Midwest, if they're white, black, Native American, or whatever. The only thing that matters is that we get the best people in these positions who will lead us well through the week so we don't have another debacle like last year. 
Along these same lines, I heard a great comment slash rebuke from one of my missionary buddies. He was looking in on this entire conversation from a distance and was seriously baffled. He wondered why people think you need to be from a particular region or have a particular skin color in order to be represented at Synod. In fact, he pushed back and said he didn't believe many people actually felt that way. He said, what if people want officers who will represent their theology rather than representing their skin color? I mean, take a moment to think about that. It's true. And to be honest, I think that better represents what we see throughout Scripture when it comes to what we're looking for when we choose leaders. I'm thinking of Acts 6 as one of those examples. Now, this isn't a deep dive into the passage, but I think it's important to look at it. A complaint came up that the Hellenists were being neglected in the daily distribution. So, in some ways, this was a cultural issue, or at least an issue that related to differing people groups. And so what types of leaders do they look to to handle this situation? We read, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Right? Acts 6.3. Three qualifications or characteristics were being looked for. A good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. That's what they were looking for. Now, I know there have been some scholars and people over the years who've analyzed the names of the people chosen and have found there to be a diversity of names in the list of leaders. And from this, they've concluded that they sought this diverse group of leaders to hand this culturally diverse situation. But that's not what the text says. It may be what happened, but it's not what the text says. We don't read the apostles saying, This is a culturally delicate situation. So we need to make sure we have a culturally diverse group of leaders. Nope. Instead, they say, we need leaders who have a good reputation, who are full of the Spirit, and who are full of wisdom. That's it. That's what they were looking for. And on a side note, I can testify that the officers of Synod 2024 meet these qualifications. They all have a good reputation. They're all full of the Spirit. And they're all full of wisdom. But we chose wisely. I mean, you can look at 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 and see the same thing. These were all diverse places with diverse people, and we never hear anything about it in the list of qualifications for elders. The only qualification is that they are the right type of people with the right gifts to get the job done. There are no DEI boxes to be checked. We're to judge people by the content of their character not the color of their skin or the lack thereof. To be honest, I think this vote was probably more than just voting in leaders with a good reputation, which they have. And it's more than voting in leaders full of the spirit and wisdom, which they are. And it's more than simply voting in leaders who are competent at their job, which they are. I actually strongly believe this vote was also a vote against something. It was a vote against the establishment and the institutionalists. I think the average Joe in the CRC is tired of the way things have been run. They're tired of the way the establishment leaders and the institutionalists have been leading things, and so they're voting new people in. None of these officers are institutional names. None of them. Rather, they're all just faithful pastors shepherding their local congregation, wanting to do something about what's happening in the denomination. That's what's happening. The average Joe member of the CRC has lost confidence in the establishment, has decided that they're going to vote in people that they know and they trust. And those people are just typical, faithful pastors. I already mentioned earlier that I spent some time looking over the officers from the past 40 years. I didn't do an in-depth analysis yet because I didn't have time this week, but I can tell you that after looking at that list for a while, you see a lot of familiar names, a lot of repeated names, and a lot of names that sound like establishment institutional names. You also see a lot of names from people who are within an hour radius of Grand Rapids. I mean, the officers of Synod for the past 40 years have been heavily stacked toward the Grand Rapids bubble, and people are tired of it. 
and they haven't liked the way that the Grand Rapids bubble has led them. So now they're voting new people in whom they trust and believe will lead them well. Here's what I think is really happening and what has happened. It's something I've been saying for years now, and other people are now starting to take notice. Things are changing in the CRCNA. Someone posted, I take the slate as pointing to a larger shift underway in the CRC, a reorientation, even a reformation. That's right. That's exactly what's happening. A reformation is happening, and it's messy. These officers were elected not because of a coup, or any form of political manipulation, but because a reformation is happening and things are changing in the Christian Reformed Church. This past week, I've been working on a sermon that includes the well-known passage from Jeremiah 29, where God gives guidance to his people in exile. He says, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. While in exile, God's people were told to build and multiply and work for the good of the city. They weren't supposed to attempt to overthrow the Babylonian government, right? No coup. They weren't supposed to practice forms of political disobedience. They were supposed to do what God had been calling them to do all along. Continue being faithful, or start being faithful, maybe. Build, multiply, and work for the good of the city because there's power in that. There's there's great power in that. And I think that's what's been happening in the Christian Reformed Church. For the past two decades, maybe even three, many of the conservatives in the Christian Reformed Church have felt like exiles in a foreign land. They've not felt at home in the CRC. Everything coming from the institution and the publications of the Christian Reformed Church felt like salt and sand being rubbed into an open wound. They were exiles in this denomination. And yet they stayed. And they remained faithful. They stayed and they built and they multiplied and they worked for the good of the Christian Reformed Church. They got married. They had kids. They built homes. They discipled their children. They discipled their churches and they multiplied. I mean, they literally multiplied by having children, but they also multiplied by passionately and joyfully embracing the theology and the doctrines of the CRC, which drew other people into the CRC because they loved what we loved. Through their faithful building and multiplying and working for the good of the Christian Reformed Church for the past two decades, the conservatives have spread slowly like leaven through a batch of dough. They spread and multiplied so slowly that people didn't recognize it was happening and it caught them off guard. It almost sounds like Pharaoh recognizing that Israel had multiplied. From Exodus 1, 7 through 10. The people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape the land. That's what happened in the CRC. And it's what's happening now. This is no coup. This is a beautiful reformation that's the result of many faithful members throughout the Christian Reformed Church building and multiplying and working for the good of this denomination for the past two decades. I'm thankful to be able to play some small role in all of this. I'm thankful that many of you have been working toward this. I would love to be able to recognize all of the faithful Christians who've been working toward this for the past two decades. But either way, this is where we are. I'm thankful for it. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do at this next synod and in the next phase of this messy reformation. That's all we have for this week. 
If you want to help us out and support the Messy Reformation, another thing you can do is sign up for our newsletter through Substack. That way, you'll get episodes and summaries sent directly to your email inbox. It will also give us the opportunity to communicate with our audience, which is one of the biggest struggles of a podcast. So head over to the Messy Reformation on Substack and sign up for our newsletter. But until then, don't forget this is Christ's church, and he bought it with his blood. And we've been warned that wolves will come in trying to destroy the flock. So keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine. Preach the word in season and out of season. And keep fighting the good fight in this messy reformation. <laughs>